Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Tim Ho. I'm director of telehealth with the UNC Lineberger Cancer Network. And I want to welcome all of you today to our research to practice lecture series. It's January 25th, 2023. I want to spend just a, a minute going over a few preliminaries and then we'll meet Dr. Guillaume and uh, get going with our lectures. So if you're having any technical difficulties at all, please call us 919 919- Four four five one thousand. You can email us unclcn at unc.edu. If you're having any trouble uh, with any part of the lecture, we want to sort that out as quickly as possible. In the event that we're not able to, for whatever reason, we will record this lecture. It will be available within a few weeks as an enduring material for credit. So uh, we'll make sure that that happens one way or another. Uh, just a reminder that we have a website at unclcn.org. It is filled with all kinds of resources and videos and a link to our learning portal, which is the way that you uh, receive credit for this lecture. Lots of information there. So we hope that uh, you'll take advantage of that. And let's go ahead and talk about Poll Everywhere. Uh, you'll have an opportunity to answer some questions that Dr. Guillaume will be sharing with you today. And then at the end, you'll be able to share your questions with, with Dr. Guillaume. I encourage you to jot those down along the way, and then be, we'll let you know when Poll Everywhere is, is open so that you get for the questions, but uh, it will be open along the way for you to answer questions. Very easy to do. You go to any browser on a smartphone, on a tablet, on a computer, what have you, and you go to pollev.com, P-O-L-L-E-V.com, any network device with a, with a browser. You enter the letters U-N-C-L-C-N, that's for UNC Lineberger Cancer Network. You'll see the questions pop up dynamically. You can respond. It's all anonymous. And then you'll be able to anonymously share your questions at the end of today's presentation. I know that most of you are here uh, not only to learn about the topic, but also to receive continuing education. We want to make sure that happens. So you need to be attending either with Zoom where you can see the slides and the video and all the components, uh, or you need to be in a designated site with a site coordinator. If you're just using Zoom audio on the phone, unfortunately, that doesn't count. Uh, if you're just watching our, our unclcn.org slash live stream, that also doesn't count for the credit. Uh, you need to be here for at least 50 minutes. You need to fill out a, an evaluation and select a certificate at the end and you need to claim credit within seven days. And with those things, uh, you should be able to get that, that free continuing education that's relevant to you for this presentation. We ask that you wait to do that until we have ended the Zoom video session. And uh, other than that, you should be good to go. Obviously, if you run into any problems, let us know. We have uh, four different series that, that we're very proud to present, our patient-centered care, our advanced practice provider, our research to practice series, which is this one, the APP series we do with uh, Dr. Uh, or uh, Dr. Trigulianos is, is the one who is, um, who is running that. And then we assist with that. And then there's a partnership with uh, Duke and Wake Forest, the SICEP partnership. And we actually have the next one of those coming up uh, the first Wednesday in February. So look for more information on that. Multidisciplinary multimodality management of locally recurrent rectal cancer with Jose Gaston Guillem, MD, MPH, MBA. And I should note that Dr. Guillem's name has a G U. I-L-L-E-M, the typeface that we chose kind of makes it hard to tell that, 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 that one of the letters is an I. So I just wanted to mention that there. Uh, and then let's, let's learn a little bit about Dr. Guillaume. He's an MD, MPH, MBA, the Chief of Gastrointestinal Surgery Division at UNC School of Medicine and the Roscoe Bennett Gray Cowper MD Distinguished Professor. Prior to joining UNC, Dr. Guillaume was an attending colorectal surgeon at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York for nearly three decades and participated in the advancement of multidisciplinary management of all forms of primary and recurrent cancers to the colon, rectum, anus, and appendix, as well as the refinement of surgical techniques for resecting the colon, rectum, and anus via open and minimally invasive approaches 
including robotic and transanal microscopic procedures. These advancements have led to improved oncological outcomes and quality of life via the preservation of anorectal bladder and sexual function, allowing curative rectal cancer surgery. Uh, he, uh, 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 he also has a keen interest in and has managed many patients afflicted with colorectal cancer at a young age, as well as patients with Lynch syndrome and or other forms of polyposis syndromes. Dr. Guillaume, welcome. We are so glad to have you here today. Thank you, Mr. Powell. And what, um, what should we know about you? Maybe one thing outside of your, your professional bio there. <laughs> What can I say? Uh, I'm glad to be here in the South. It's my third uh, anniversary this uh, March. Great. Came in the middle of COVID, and I, I want to thank everyone for welcoming me um, and uh, enjoyed the introduction. You've set the bar high, Mr. Poe. You're quite an eloquent speaker. I will try to follow with appropriate uh, clarity. So glad to be here. All right. Well, we are very glad to have you. I mentioned poll everywhere. Our first question, we always make it kind of a softball. Uh, rectal cancer treatment options include surgery, radiation therapy, chemotherapy, targeted therapy, and active surveillance. So true or false? Um, while you're thinking about, the, our audience is thinking about that, I will mention uh, our disclosures. I no longer need to read the whole thing. So take a look at that. Take, take it in if you need to for a moment. And we'll go on and see how our audience is doing. Uh, let's see. I, I think we're trending in a particular direction. What do you think, Dr. Guillaume? Yeah, I think so. All right. How are they doing? Well. Great. So so all of the, all of the above. And with that, I'll, I'll leave it to you. Great. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for allowing me to join you during your lunch hour, and I'll get started uh, if I can move forward. Good. So that's my disclosure, consultant from to surgical. And more importantly, I would say that um, um, the uh, I, this is a surgeon's perspective on the multimodality therapy for recurrent rectal cancer. I've worked, uh, uh, I've enjoyed working in, uh, in my prior institutions and certainly here as well with a variety of colleagues that are part of this team, part of this village that handles these very complex cases. And I'll mention that, but this is my surgeon perspective that's been influenced by my other members of the multidisciplinary team. So uh, what I'm gonna speak about is the multidisciplinary approach to locally recurring rectal cancer. I'll share some data from other institutions. Uh, I'll discuss some of the measurable and immeasurable benefits that help us do what we do. And then some of the ongoing challenges that we face and look forward to addressing here at UNC Lineberger Cancer Center. Um, just to show you some of the history behind this, this is surgery for local recurrence, rectal cancer, and you can see from the dates, this is 30 years ago, um, with some survival numbers shown here. But the bottom line is overall five-year survival rates range from 18 to 49 percent back then versus 10% for those that were untreated. And often this was perceived, certainly during my surgical training when I was at Columbia in the 80s, early 90s, this was sort of an untreatable situation uh, with um, almost fatalistic thoughts behind it. But 10% untreated results uh, supported that idea. But we've come a long way, and I'd like to share with you some of that data that supports us being very aggressive with these cases. Before I go into that, I want to just lay the foundation for the basic surgical options for rectal cancer that will help us understand some of the recurrent patterns. So if you look at this frontal view of the pelvis here, uh, the bony pelvis, the sphincter muscles, and the rectum in the middle with these different valves here, and that's the dark dot there is a rectal cancer. And one way to remove this is to treat it with what's called a local excision, which simply removes the lesion and does not remove any of the surrounding fatty tissue where the lymph nodes may be involved. So that's one surgical approach and a different approach, which is suitable for some patients, but in other situations where the tumor may be the same size, but we have evidence that it has spread to the nodes and the surrounding tissue called the mesorectum, this requires a more definitive operation. This is what we refer to as a total mesorectal excision. And what we've also learned over the years is that the uh, ability to do these procedures when we're doing a total mesorectal excision is facilitated by our, our appreciation 
that the internal sphincter is a continuation of the extension of the rectal wall. So for a very low line rectal cancer, such as this one here, that's approaching this, the, the levator muscul musculature, we now know from understanding the anatomy a bit better that we can resect this and get a negative margin and still have opportunities for reconstruction and having the uh, avoidance of a permanent colostomy. We've also had tremendous advancements in imaging, and this is actually a 1997 image you can see, and you can imagine how much more clarity we have now. But this is 1997, and you're looking into the pelvis uh, of a male patient, and that's the bladder in the front, that's the rectum, this is the mesorectal fat around it, these are the seminal vesicles here. Um, and the plane that we want to be operating in is in this beautiful embryological plane that I'll show you some pictures that facilitates our ability to remove the disease and yet leave important structures such as nerves that are important for bladder and sexual function. The, um, you can see the lymph node pattern here uh, along what's called the IMA, and this is the frontal view of the rectum. Um, and we've also learned to appreciate that these tumors can spread from here along this pattern, the zone of upward spread, as it are referred to, and there are nodes involved in this region. So now our very aggressive approach with the initial cancer is to do what's called a high IMA ligation, remove all the disease, try to get below it, and reconstruct. And as we do this, we now, with the great assistance from our pathology team, they are now giving us a scorecard. They can provide at the end of the procedure, whether we've done a good, bad, or the ugly, as the old movie would say, quality work, and this is the score that they'll look to see that the mesorectal fascia is intact. And that has significant prognosis. At the same time as we're removing this rectal cancer, we want to leave this important pelvic nerve structures along the side for bladder and sexual function. So this is a very complicated undertaking. And this is just an intraoperative view here pointing out as we have transected the sigmoid, we're lifting up the rectum with these clamps, looking at the patient from the patient's left side into the pelvis, you can see that's the point of the dissection of the mesorectum, but all the important vital structures that are just surroundings, that's the challenge of this operation. But in terms of recurrence, because of these advancements in imaging and our ability to do these procedures, once we remove the rectum, the recurrent pattern often is to the pelvic sidewall. And that's where I'm going to be discussing today is the role of this multidisciplinary approach that once you've done this operation with all of these technical advances, if it fails, it can fail laterally, and that's a challenging area to be operating in. And I'll show you a picture here of this kind of challenge. For those of you who are not radiologists, and I'm not one, but I've interacted with them enough that they've taught me some of the views. This is just a slice through the body of the pelvis of a patient here, and you can see the white is the bony structures. There's the sacrum, the coccygeal region, the pelvic sidewall. And this mass here, this is all occupied mass of disease and rectum. And this is a patient who challenged us, but with our multidisciplinary approach, we're able, we embarked on this care of this individual here. This is a, a situation you can measure the dimensions of this large teens and nine by 15 or so centimeters um, with some lymph node involvement coming laterally onto, this, onto the levator musculature. Here's the levator muscles and all this, all this white stuff is mucin and there's disease that's dark. But this is quite expansive and approaching the lateral pelvic side. Well, similarly, anteriorly here along the mass, along the prostate, uh, very concerning. And this gentleman had been diverted initially. And you can see the dimensions of this, 15 by uh, 11, very large occupying mass. And this is what it looked like. This gentleman had had these cetons in place to avoid abscesses and prevent reaccumulation of septic disease as a temporizing measure. And what I'm going to show you is some graphic photos, but um, just to make the point of how we, in this case, work with multiple individuals to um, alleviate this problem. And this is uh, looking at now, I'll just back up. This is what it looks like. And as we begin the dissection circumferentially around this, trying to get a negative margin, um, we're using different retractors. You can see to try to get, as you'll see the data that I'll show you, a negative margin is essential for looking to cure. This is a view of the abdomen where we have now closed the stoma and our plastic surgical colleagues have come in and demarcated what they will be using as a skin and muscular cutaneous flap 
to fill the gap in the big hole that we're going to make as we take this problem out. And that's a closer view. After we've we've done the resection from the abdominal side, the plastic surgeons will close the abdomen here at the skin level just to excise the flap. Uh, and that's what this looks like. This is the, uh, the, uh, the abdominal view. And you can see the significant, this is a procedure in itself. We do the first part, removing the problem from both the abdominal side. We will flip the patient over to the posterior side. Then we'll flip him back to get this flap back down into the pelvis. It's a whole day affair. Um, here's the patient belly prone down. Um, and here's where we're beginning to excise these the area with the drain that we started in the in the in the lithotomy position. Now we're prone position. That's the cavitating problem that we had there. We're trying to figure out how far up along the sacrum should we cut to be able to assure a negative margin. And this is we're using radiographically. This is a side view. There's the tailbone and my orthopedic colleagues have now joined us and have put a, a fiduciary marker here to be able to determine from the skin level and where we think the tumor is to know exactly how far onto the tailbone we will be cutting because we obviously don't want to cut more than we need to, but we want to assure a negative margin. So this is a com combination of different expertise. And this is the disease now being mobilized, being removed. Uh, here it is what's coming out. And this is a situation where everything it's an exoneration with multiple organs being removed, including the disease, the bladder, the prostate, and other organs. Because the goal is to get a negative margin. Now, this is the backside. The patient's prone. We This is the flap that the plastic surgeons created. We've got, we've transected across the sacrum. This is some bone wax, as we call, and that's a small intestine. So the plastic surgeons will now fill this large space with that abdominal flap that they harvested, and that's what that's filling the space in now. And this is very challenging surgery, not only to remove it, but also to have stellar plastic surgical abilities to bring this very large muscular cutaneous flap down into the pelvis to close it and still leave the abdominal domain intact. So just a point, this is just a graphic slide for one of our plastic surgeons. What we're, what we're doing, what they've done here, after we've done our procedures to harvest this, very delicately, leaving the pedicle of the blood supply from the inferior epigastric and flipping it down. This is an illustration of a female patient. And in these where the posterior vagina wall has been removed, they can do some beautiful work, um, de-skin these flaps and can reconstruct the posterior wall of the vagina for functionality. So a tremendous uh, collaborative support from the plastic surgical team. So I, I've mentioned some of the multidisciplinary players and obviously radiologists, the pathologists who give us great not only post-op, but also intraoperative frozen section to allow us to know, have we gone adequately laterally enough? Our medical and radiation oncologists who help us preoperatively uh, in shrinking these, these, these lesions uh, locally, as well as giving us uh, support systemically so that we know that uh, as much as we will succeed locally, we also have control of the distant disease. And I'll show you some work on radiation oncologists involved in during the procedure, what we refer to as intraoperative radiation therapy, our urologists who will help us with cystoscopy and stent placement. And, and when we're doing an exoneration, they're obviously the team doing the bladder removal. Orthopedics, neurosurgeons for the bony components, the, 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 the nerve involvement, plastic surgeons for reconstruction, tremendous support from enteral stomotherapies preoperatively to helping us mark the ideal location, depending on the body habitus and the patient's uh, wishes. And then postoperatively, how to manage these very complicated wounds and stoma issues. Of course, the surgeon, anesthesiologist, nursing, nurse practitioners, the physical therapist, occupational therapist, and the list goes on. And a very important component, of course, is psychosocial services who ha help, have to help us as we propose a very challenging um, treatment for these patients who have to embrace what it means to go through a long process and the uncertainty that this may or may not help them as an individual, but it's the only shot they have. Um, the surgical principles of, of, of recurrent disease, and we want to be able to use preoperative chemo radiation therapy if they have not had it administered preoperatively for the prior surgery. Long-term results are related to the completeness of the resection. That's a theme I've already been developing here, the adequacy, removal of everything with negative histological margins. And the partial resection with corrosive residual disease really do not provide any surgical benefit. So that's a 
very big challenge for us as a team. And that's what we do is we present these cases in our multidisciplinary conference preoperatively where we have imaging, we have the presence of our colleagues in the multiple disciplines looking at what's our likelihood of succeeding and getting this disease out with negative margins. Because if we feel that we're not able to, then we may not pursue an operation. We may pursue it in a palliative manner, but in a curative manner, we really have to think that we're going to get it out with negative margins. And of course, we gladly welcome, I and you know, those of you who know me, I always say my some of my best friends are radiation oncologists because we've worked on this so much. And I really feel like I have the support. We're the, we're the soldiers in the battlefield, but we've got air support. I sort of make the analogy with our radiation oncologists. When we get close margins, I like to know that if we're going to have an added benefit of delivering intraoperative radiation therapy. So curative resection, patient selections, I mentioned that. It's important to know that no distant metastases, um, which is what we don't want to be doing this operation on someone who's a problem distantly that may, may define their survival more so than the local problem. But interestingly, 25 to 50% of these locally recurrent rectal cancers are confined to the pelvis. So that's our goal. How do we find that group? And then we look at other suitabilities and uh, make sure that they're a good surgical candidate. And that's the group that we will like to pursue. Um, it's a reasonable life expectancy. We're very clear with these patients. We don't want to overestimate uh, what we can do. Um, and the lesion potentially resectable with an on block with negative margins. That's our goal. On block meaning that we're going to remove the adjacent organs and they understand that it may require that not only the vagina, but the bladder and other organs may need to come out. If we can get a negative margin, we have the ability to reconstruct and leave them in a functional manner. So just some of the early work that we did uh, was to begin to define the regions of pelvic recurrence. And the question was, if it's anterior, is a lateral, posterior, does that knowledge allow us to anticipate our success rate with getting a negative margin? And that's the, I'm going to show you some data on that. So due to the extent of local invasion, the curative resections for rectal cancers are mostly feasible only for suture line recurrences. What that means is that if the lesion, if the problem is in axially located, not to the pelvic side walls, but in the center, um, uh, we believe using intraoperative radiation therapy for those side walls is of value. Um, it increases tumor dose relative to normal tissue. The intraoperative delivery to the area of greatest concern, we can target that site and we can protect the surrounding structures, and we can deliver it in one single fraction. We, I mean my radiation oncology. I just get the disease out of the way. They come in and we together strategize what we, where I think there's a concern, what they think is a concern, and then they deliver it. So it's a great uh, collaborative effort. So this data looks at determinants of resectability and colorectal cancer pelvic recurrences. This was 109 patients with locally recurrent rectal cancer. 101, or colon, 18 of them. All of these patients were brought to the intraoperative radiation therapy suite with a planned resection some time ago. And here we have R0, meaning we got it out completely. Um, R1 is that we thought we got it out, but the pathologist later said, well done, Jose, you got the mass out, but the margins are positive. That's a sinking feeling. But in those situations, when we have intraoperative radiation therapy, we feel that with the penetration, uh, that IORT delivers to that site, we've, we've done some good. R2 is when we think we've left gross residual disease. And that's, an, that's a, what I consider not an ideal situation. That means that our preoperative imaging, our planning, our decision, to the best of our ability, we thought we were going to get it out. We were in there and we're like, wow, we, we didn't realize that. And that's a challenge that we hope to overcome with collaborative imaging and, and, and us clinicians involved in deciding what are the what are the criteria for thinking we're going to get it out? And palliative is there are some situations where you know you probably will not get it out, but you palliate some symptoms by diversion. And so we looked at the locations. Uh, anatomic involvement was it axial, meaning in the center, was it anterior, posterior, or lateral? And we looked at the imaging as we would look at it in conference, and based upon CT or MRI findings what was the likelihood of us succeeding in getting an R0 resection? So as I've been alluded to, the pelvic sidewall involvement, uh, yes and no, you can see statistically different. So the lateral pelvic sidewall involvement in recurrence usually portends a less likelihood of us getting it out with a negative margin. 
and the hydroureteronephrosis, the dilation of the ureter, well, goes along with that because they're located laterally. So when we see that, this also on imaging, it suggests that we're going to have a challenging situation of getting it out with an R0 with a negative margin. So this is helpful in terms of surgical planning. And again, an anatomical involvement, whether it's axial, axial anterior, lateral, posterior, you can see axial meaning right in the center. That makes sense. It's easy to get around it. If it's anterior, that's not usually as not that um, uh, we should be able to get it out if we can remove all the organs. Posteriorly, and um, if there's vessel involvement along the iliac, that's a concern. Yes versus no. You can see significantly involvement. Even though we can recruit the vascular surgeons to help us with reconstructions, once the disease is entered the iliac vessels, not impossible, but it just suggests that it's going to be challenging because it's not only involving the vessels, but the tissue lateral and posterior to those vessels. So the summary from that study is that 51% of patients were able to undergo an R0 resection. So you can look at this as half full or half empty, but uh, we thought it was promising um, and we wanted to pursue it further. But this is with careful scrutiny, we were able to proceed with an R0 resection in only half of the population, um, but that's better than none. Uh, tumors confined to the axial or axial anterior location were more likely to be removed with an R0 resection because if, if it's anterior, that just means you've got to take the bladder out, and that's what we can do with our urology colleagues. However, tumors involving the pelvic sidewall were rarely able to be removed completely, so that's a concerning area. And then hydroureteronephrosis or pelvic sidewall involvement on the CT or MRI were again associated with low likelihood of an R0 resection. We then decided to look at what would be the predictors of survival in 100 of these recurrent rectal cancers having undergone resection and intraoperation therapy. So this is beginning to look at what are the results beyond just the operation and margins. How do, the, how do things look a couple of years after surgery? And so this is the follow-up that was initially short, only two years on 100 patients. You can see 60% at two years had a recurrence after. This is a re-recurrence. Um, and we're going to go into whether there was local, distant, or having both. But locally, it's a concern because one-third of them fail locally despite this very aggressive operation with intraoperative radiation therapy. But remember the day that I showed you early at the beginning, only 10% were going to make it without any, without any um, input from a uh, multidisciplinary approach. We then look to see what are the factors that would uh, define disease-free survival after having undergone surgery with intraoperative therapy. And you can see here the importance of an R0 resection. R0 survival is improved compared to those that have a microscopic or a gross disease. So microscopic and gross disease, unfortunately, behave similarly. So if you do the surgery and you have a microscopic positive margin, that's a concerning situation. So we always aspire, and we're not always able to succeed, but we shoot for an R0 resection. Now, the other component is that we don't have too much control over, and this is the biology, because those that have vascular, at the level of the microscope, the pathologist will tell us there is or there is not vascular invasion. There are other many variables that they tell us, but vascular invasion, you can see the presence of it, is associated with a poor disease-free survival. So in summarizing that study, an R0 resection following IORT is associated with 69% local control and 51% five-year survival for recurrent rectal cancer. An R1 and R2 resections following IORT is associated with 39% local control and 14% five-year um, survival. So very important to try to get a negative margin. And then vascular invasion is, the is in the recurrent specimen is associated with inferior local control and disease-free survival, disease-specific survival. So this is, comes into play when we have a recurrent cancer and we happen to biopsy that recurrence and there's evidence of vascular invasion on the biopsy, which sometimes does show up. That pause gives us pause because we then begin to say, well, not only do we see vascular invasion, but this is onto the pelvic side. Well, this is less likely for it to come out versus we don't have vascular invasion and it's located anteriorly, axially. This, we stand a better chance of pursuing this operation. I want to show you some more mature data now looking at a median follow-up of 53 months, double the amount that I just showed you, 
And you can see the five-year local failure, 33%, distant failure, 47%, and defined by R0, um, uh, local failure rates are low. And as we get into the R, R1, uh, we begin to see the numbers rise. So, so just the, the very obvious take-home message that you're now sensing is the, the importance of R0 resection. Get it out with a negative margin to the best of your ability. So that brings us back to the conference, deciding at that conference do we think we're going to get it out. Um, I'm going to show you some other more mature results here with a median uh, IRT dose of 1,500 CGY, follow-up of 52 months, five-year overall, and disease-free survival of 49 and 37% respectively. And again, positive margin status was a predictor of overall, overall survival local failure and disease-free survival on multivariate analysis. So the management of local recurrent rectal cancers as we see it, and it's an evolution, but with patients who have not had prior radiation therapy, we will lean towards giving them preoperative chemo radiation therapy and then carefully look to do the surgery and uh, evaluate for the possibility of intraoperative radiation therapy. So these require coordination between us and a number of the colleagues that I've mentioned, but specifically with a radiation oncologist to determine will they get pre-op and will they be getting intra-op. And this is a designated OR suite that most centers have uh, that who are in this, in this program will have the capacity. We have the capacity here at UNC, and this requires coordination to utilize that room. There's only one, so scheduling is an issue. If they've had prior radiation therapy, we will decide whether it makes sense to give them preoperative chemotherapy of a type that they have not had in the past and then pursue surgery, surgery with interoperative therapy. If there's metastatic disease or poor surgical candidate, then we may deliver just palliative radiation therapy. Um, I'm going to show you some data from the Mayo Clinic, which is another institution with a very robust experience looking at um, this period from 81 through 2008, 607 patients, oops, and um, they had prior radiation therapy in 40% of those, and uh, that's the same dosage that was used, and their follow-up here is three years. And again, you can see the curve similar to us, R0, survival, and you can see how it drops down, and R1 and R2 are behaving somewhat similar, but R2, that's positive gross disease. This is microscopic disease. Um, when you look at their experience, when they were looking at the added benefit, benefit of having had chemo versus no chemotherapy, there is some at five years, but somewhat overlapping later, but at five years, there was benefit to those that received chemo versus no chemotherapy and prior to going to the recurrent resection. And this is an interesting slide that looks at the, uh, their experience as they broke it up into time periods before and after uh, 97, that after 97, all of the factors that were involved in them and probably surgical experience, radiation therapy, and all the other uh, uh, contributors, contributing factors, uh, that as an institution, they were doing better than they might have been prior to 97. So whether this was chemo, surgery, radiation, I'm probably all the above, better selection of patients. Um, but bottom line, I see it is there is room for improvement um, as we go in, on in time. And I think it's just the coordination of the team. You'd have to believe that also played a major role. This is a, a, a pool analysis of the Mayo Clinic and Katharina Hospital. Again, uh, looking at a large sample size R0 in about 44%, similar to what we were seeing um, with preoperative chemo radiation, it's 54%. So some ability to shrink the disease and get a better resection. Uh, Five-year results, um, you can see local failure, distant meds. And it greatly, again, dependent on R0 versus R1 and R2. So you're, you're getting the message of the importance of R0 versus R1 and R2. And here it is depicted in color for you. Um, and uh, with chemo and no chemo, sort of similar to what we're seeing. Um, and this is the Heidelberg experience, 107 patients, location of the recurrence, the percent intraluminal and extraluminal. A number of them were intraluminal, they're more axial ones, as opposed to extraluminal onto the pelvic sidewall. Their ability of an R0 section was 59%. 
and uh, 69% had intraoperative radiation therapy. They had a re-recurrence rate of 38% at follow-up of 42 months. Um, our experience at Sloan in that back then was 33% at 60 months, so much longer follow-up, and our recurrence rate was uh, lower. So you would probably want to wonder, is would the results have been superior with greater utilization of intraoperation therapy? Because they only used 69% of, this, of these recurrent cases had intraoperation therapy. We used it on 100% of our, our data is based on 100% intraoperation therapy. So perhaps you could say uh, that had they used intraoperation therapy, the results would be a little bit better. This is a courtesy of my colleague, Dr. Tejo Nagihara, demonstrating the intraoperation therapy unit at, here at UNC, uh, where this device is able to very carefully position and focus the radiation to the target of concern without with minimal collateral radiation therapy. So I'd like to conclude that, um, I have several conclusions, but relative to historical controls, patients with locally recurrent and or T4 rectal cancer are benefited by multimodality therapy, incorporating optimal chemotherapy, external beam radiation therapy, surgery, and intraoperative radiation therapy, with an overall survival increase from 31% in the 1990s to in the average 45 or 50% today. However, distant failure remains a problem. With a widespread utilization of this total mesorectal excision technique, which I pointed out to you is going very wide, I think the proportion of extraluminal and pelvic sidewall recurrence is not amenable to a nausea resection are likely to increase. What I mean by that is that we, as we've gotten good at appreciating that anatomy that I pointed out at the beginning, going very wide, leaving the nerves intact, that's great surgery. But unfortunately, despite all this advancement, there are still single-digit failures, not zero. We, we're seeing recurrences, even in the optimal setting, 8%, 6%. So that group, when it fails, it fails in an expansive manner like that patient that I showed. With, and since we've been to the pelvic sidewall, if it recurs, it'll be at that boundary, so to speak. And this is where the challenging situation of operations are. As I pointed out, the pelvic sidewall is a tough domain to operate in. And that's why I think intraoperative therapy will help us. Also, for those of you who work in this field, we know the increasing utilization of watch and wait approach or the non-operative management. Just to, in a nutshell, to, tell, to, to share with you, for those who may not be working in the rectal cancer field, Watch and wait or non-operative management is an approach that's being explored for people who undergo chemo radiation therapy and then to the best of our ability, whether it's digital exam, imaging, or endoscopic view, we think it's totally gone. And rightfully so, patients, families, and colleagues will say, well, maybe we don't have to do this operation because clinically it's gone, but pathologically we don't know. So some patients and families are, are choosing this watch and wait approach. And my concern is that although this is a great option for some very carefully selected patients, which we're still trying, we still struggle with, with who are those ideal patients. But if you do pursue this watch and wait approach, and if it does recur or persist later and it becomes noticeable, and you have to do this operation, I suspect they're going to be to the pelvic sidewall. So this is going to get us back to this challenging scenario where I think this multidisciplinary approach with with incorporation of intraoperation therapy be very useful. So I think the role of IRT in this increasing patient population of local recurrences needs to, will be examined in phase three randomized trials to demonstrate whether it actually will be of um, a significant benefit. I'd also like to touch upon what I consider some in, immeasurable benefits of intraoperative radiotherapy. I think as a surgeon, I started at Sloan in the 1990s as a brand new minted colorectal surgeon. And I must say, uh, it gave me pause when we saw some of these very challenging cases. And it was re it was reassuring for me to know that I had my team of radiation oncologists backing me up for that situation where I would do the best I could in an unblocked manner, get out the disease. But if it was close, I wouldn't know that it was close until it was post-op. The pathologist would let me know it was an R1 or an R0 resection. So this added a layer of assurance, uh, helped a lot of us surgeons operating in the, in these, in these domains to develop expertise and taking on these cases that we otherwise might have hesitated and say, I don't think I can do this. 
because I'm not sure I'll get a negative margins. But fortunately, most of the margins are negative. But in those few that were R1, it was good to know that we had the support of our radiation oncologist. So I think this has pushed the development of surgical technique at large, as well as benefit a number of individuals who we thought were inoperable. And we may not have pursued doing surgery on them, but glad we did. Um, Unanswered questions in the multimodality management of local recurrent rectal cancer. There are many. I list some of them here. Of course, patient selection, and we work closely, and we are we I, we developed a really robust uh, group here of colleagues um, in the radi radiology group that help us with a standard CT scan, MRI, and PET imaging for patient selection. And this, of course, there's ongoing research here. Uh, in the Lamberger Cancer Center or other centers uh, around the state here and in the country looking at improving imaging. The role of induction chemotherapy, um, the improved adjuvant chemotherapy that our colleagues are exploring, the role of immunotherapy, especially those that are in mismatch repair deficient, and then efforts to try to define the targets for intraoperative radiation therapy, focal, regional, how can we deliver this? Can we to come up with methodologies that allow us to minimize the collateral damage. So there's a lot of efforts ongoing in that area. I just want to acknowledge uh, some of the colleagues that I've worked with and I'm working with now, Kevin Perlstein and Ted Yanagihara, our radiation oncologists here at UNC, excellent collaborators. Karen Goodman, who's a colleague from MSK, who's now at Mount Sinai, I better list her because we, we grew up together. Uh, Leonard Gunderson, who I never worked with, but a lot of interactions when he was at the Mayo Clinic and thinking about these challenging. Bruce Minsky, my dear, dear friend from way back in 1991, well, we, he was there before I started at Islam, but he led a lot of these national and international projects. He's now at Andy Anderson. Medical oncologist here at, at UNC, uh, Karen Gia, Dr. Hannah Sanoff, Ashwin Samasundaran, Jonathan Sora, and then us, the surgical group working on this, myself and colorectal surgery, Dr. Muni Kapadia, and other colorectal surgeon, Jonathan Stem, colorectal surgeon, and Karen Stitzenberg, the surgical oncologist. So I think my next slide um, is, I guess we've got some answers here. Is that? We do. We, we have uh, some of our audience. Uh, thank you. Went ahead and, and jumped in and and took a shot at those questions, but uh, we encourage uh, those who have not yet done that. Mm -hmm. Factors negatively impacting the likelihood of obtaining a negative margin or R0 resection of the locally recurrent rectal cancer include, and then uh, A, patient age, B, lateral location of recurrence, C, distance of recurrence from the anal sphincters, and D, invasion of sphincters by recurrence. So uh, mm -hmm. we'll wait another five seconds or so, and then you can let them know how they're doing. Mm -hmm. Again, we seem to to uh, be be landing on one answer, Dr. Guillaume. Is that is that the one you were looking for? I I, I am. I'm just checking to make sure then. Great. Thank you. Uh, great. Excellent. Um, I said lateral enough. You might, now this is before the presentation or at the end? Do they already know this? Uh, they, they just started doing this within the last couple minutes. Okay, great, great, excellent. Uh, I, I'm glad you mentioned that it was at the end. It's because if they got this right from the beginning, they didn't need to hear the lecture. But I guess this is... <laughs> <laughs> so I no. just, if you can go back to that for a second, I just want to make a absolutely. point. Absolutely. Tim, thank you. So absolutely correct. It's a lateral location. And that invasion of the sphincters, and this is from the recurrent, from the sphincters, was a sort of a, a um, attempt to trick some of you. And uh, the point being that in these situations where we're dealing with a recurrence, uh, I would say, in my experience, most patients had a sphincter saving operation at the beginning, let's say, right? They had a removal of the rectal cancer, and it was not involving the muscles. They were reconstructed. But now they've, a year or sometime later, they have a recurrence. They sort of understand that a sphincter saving opportunity at this time is probably not likely. Uh, most will still like to proceed with a curative operation. Um, so the invasion of the sphincters would only be an issue for those that are saying, I would rather die or, or not go on with this. But most patients I find at this point, they, they've, they're, they're acceptance, right? their acceptance for removal of uh, that sphincter and creation of a colostomy is, is, uh, is quite high. So that was a bit of a trick question because technically we can just remove the sphincters. 
And um, so let's let's see what the next slide shows. All right, and so you should be able to see that for those. Uh, Looking on your, your computer or phone, multidisciplinary management of locally recurrent rectal cancer can compensate for a positive surgical margin, A, true, or B, false. And again, let, well, let's take about 10 more seconds, give people time to answer that. Just want a, a big shout out to uh, everyone for being here. Uh, I know everyone's busy and Got a lot going on and trying to grab some lunch at the same time, but uh, but boy, this is well worth it, Dr. Gam. This is fascinating and really appreciate our audience jumping in and, and answering these questions. How are they doing on this one? Uh, good. I I, um, I I think that was, you know, it's fluctuating, but I, I would say that, and perhaps I didn't make it that clear, I think that they are the positive margins, we would say all of us in the multidisciplinary team is, you know, shoot for the negative margin. Uh, and this was beat into my head by my great colleague, Bruce Minsky, who would state that there's, there's nothing in radiation oncology or medical oncology that, comp that could compensate for a positive surgical margin. So we, uh, that is, uh, at this current time, that is the goal for us. That's not to say that if we get a positive margin, we're fatalistic and say this is it. I've had some patients who have done well despite a positive margin and we delivered intraoperative radiation therapy. I was anxious for several years and then five years later, they're doing great. And you'd have to think that the radiation intraoperatively helped in that situation. But the, the message from us as we, as we train the, the surgical residents in the team is let's shoot for everything we can do to get a positive margin. If that means removal of an adjacent organ that, um, that we can reconstruct urologically or with plastic surgeons help, uh, then we should pursue that. Gotcha. Should we go on to the next question? Yes. Thank you. All right. Okay. So advancements in multimodality therapies have resulted in increased survival of patients with locally recurrent rectal cancer managed in centers with expertise in a multidisciplinary approach, true or false. And, uh, See what we get here. Well, that's great. <laughs> that's I'm glad that um, that's unanimous. Um, um, and I, I I'm I'm glad the data at least was um, telling that message. I think that uh, it's it um, demonstrates that this multidisciplinary approach and all the advances that have come about in, in so many different arenas, whether it's imaging, surgical, radiation, medical oncology, the support of our colleagues and other disciplines, uh, the care the patients get before and after surgery. I mean, uh, this um, speaks of uh, the rehabilitation of these patients as well and the support emotionally of what they're facing. And uh, uh, that's, that's a, a big part of what we do behind the scenes, but an important component because if in the hospital, if they're, have, if they're going to have a complication post-op after a 10-hour procedure, because we didn't ambulate them or we didn't address their other potential uh, complications like wound infections and other things that, that are part of a nursing support team, APPs and PT and OT on the floor, that, that, and then we fail despite getting a negative margin. Right. Right. No one can imagine the, you know, those were are, are disturbing pictures and, and when one imagines the impact that must have on a patient and certainly leads one to think about all, all the roles of all of those involved in supporting the patient. I'll go ahead and uh, open up that, that last slide where our audience can may uh, share their questions and I've got a couple to get us started on. Certainly is actually have a big list here, but I won't have time for all of them. I promise to uh, to uh, give the the lion's share of those to to our audience. But tell us tell us more about what uh, that multidisciplinary uh, approach. And you know, our our team is very familiar with multidisciplinary tumor boards. We actually do the technical behind the scenes facilitation of 20 now at UNC. So, so but, but from your standpoint, what, what is the optimal multidisciplinary conversation look like? And are there particular best practices that you like to see uh, in a multidisciplinary conference? Yeah, great question. I think um, 
often what what we what we do what I would say as a team we sort of know what each other wants to hear at the presentation so getting the facts uh, available in terms of the history what were the prior therapies that this patient had what was the result of the surgery often we want to know what did, did they do was this, do we have access to the operative note from the prior operation were the margins negative back then or not what was the what was the staging of it um, and again, what chemotherapies did they receive? What were the dosage of radiation? What were the fields that were included? So all of this is fact gathering beforehand. Mm-hmm. And I think as a, as a multidisciplinary team, we know that if I'm going there as a surgeon, I should at least be able to speak clearly about what we think happened surgically. So often it requires us reaching out to the prior surgical team if we were not involved in the first time. So it's reaching out to them. And I'm, I, I'm certain our medical oncologists will, will often need to call the other institutions and gather that information. So it extends beyond our individual UNC borders, which is important because those are the primary care physicians and family doctors are the ones who ultimately will say to the patient, I think this makes sense. I did speak to this guy, Guillaume, who called me up, and I think that they've got a good team there. So it extends beyond our borders. But in terms of the conference, uh, we've got phenomenal radiology presence. All this is included uh, at that conference. Um, but uh, oftentimes it's before we even get to conference. I'll reach out to my colleagues or they'll reach out to me and say, well, I, I've got this case I want you to see and we'll present it at a conference. So we'll, we'll have a pre-conference discussion. Are there, are there certain, uh, I've, I've got to guess that, that occasionally you'll get a question from somebody else on the team that, that, that just, you know, kind of enlightens or, or, or might even surprise you when you go, oh my gosh, I hadn't even thought about that, but that, that really provides some additional insight into mm-hmm. what the patient may need or, or how to treat the patient. Are, are there any of those generally that come to mind? Oh yeah, absolutely. I think that, um, um, you know, we might've not thought about the pathological significance of, um, often we're on top of it, but if, for example, the mismatch repair deficient populations, we need that information from pathology mm-hmm. and, uh, or we need input from genetics who clarifies some of the alterations that we're seeing that may be beyond our individual expertise, but we have the ability to reach out to them beforehand. So there's a robust group of collaborators involved. I think the other thing is also in terms of once, we are, once we're beyond the conference, uh, then it's a sequence and call to the urologist, to the plastic surgeons, to the radiation oncologist, exactly what are the steps that we're going to do that day of the operation? Who goes first? Who follows? Who in what order? So the, the timing and the sequence, because we don't want to be there thinking about how we're going to do it. That's going to yeah. be orchestrated way ahead of time. Yeah. yeah. What, um, we're going, we're going to be uh, doing a presentation on uh, the role of the caregiver coming up. Uh, either for the patient, well, for, for the patient and also for the caregiver, are there unique uh, scenarios for, for the patient and in terms of recovery and for the caregiver um, to, to these sorts of surgeries? If I understand correctly, you want to know what do patients need to be informed about what their experience will be mm-hmm. postoperatively? Pa- patients and their caregivers. So, so, Look, you know, looking at uh, looking at some of the images that that you showed earlier on, one can imagine that this is going to have a very dramatic impact on on one's life. And mm-hmm. and so, what are are there? You un- thinking about the patients and their caregivers? What are what are some of the unique challenges for these kinds of surgeries? Mm-hmm. Yeah, great question. Well, certainly beyond the you know the the emotional impact and uh, psycho social impact to them. What does it mean? I think one of the big concerns is ambulation and uh, laying in bed. Some of them are not able to, especially when we have a flat reconstruction, they're not able to lay flat on their back. They have to be lying on the left side and the right side, almost like a rotisserie chicken. They cannot lay flat on their back. Ambulation may be limited. Um, so we go through some careful discussions preoperatively, but what kind of support services do you have at home? Um, where do you live and, you know, will there be family members and beyond what's available to you through the insurance uh, or other local facilities? Um, what does it mean to have uh, two stomas? If you've had your rectum removed and your bladder removed, that's, we can reconstruct, but they have to understand that people, and we have numerous, and one thing we do, actually, Mr. Paul, is a good question. I have accumulated over the years a number of 
grateful patients, I refer to them, who on their own volition have reached out to me and said, Dr. Kim, I'm so glad I'm so many years out, and I'm sure there are going to be a number of patients out there who are devastated by this idea of having a permanent bag. If and when you have someone who's facing this, let me let me be available. I can give you a number of individuals who, one in particular, I will not mention his name, but he, he calls me annually, tells me, hey, Dr. Guillem, uh, Tony and I were, his wife, Tony and I were scuba diving again because you told me that I would be able to scuba dive. So he's five years out, but he understands what that the function, that the quality of life in his mind, mm -hmm. ability to do what was important to him, scuba dive and other sports, he can do. So we yeah. share this. Because there's only so much I can share with a patient, but I'm quick to say, if I know you're wrestling with all of this, but we can provide patients, grateful patients who've lived through what you will be going through, can give you from from their perspective what the challenges were. So that's really quite helpful. That's phenomenal. That's that that's got to be incredibly reassuring to a patient to mm -hmm. to be able to hear from another patient who has gone through this. And, yeah, uh, her or his experiences. Yeah, it's so quite inspirational to me to, to recognize that we have so many patients who offer that because the struggle, it's really quite impressive. Yeah. The willingness, they offer it. I don't even ask it. They just want to be able to help out. Mm. It's quite nice. That's wonderful. Uh, we've got just a couple of minutes left. I uh, haven't had any questions come in yet, but please, if you have a question, if you're having any trouble getting that through a uh, poll everywhere, you can drop it in the chat as well, though. But but poll everywhere is great and that should be working. Um, one last question I've got. What What's if, if we were to have you back and I hope we can maybe in two or three years, what what would you expect you might be talking about this kind of on, on the edge, on the cusp that that you hope to be able to share more about if, if you were to, again, two to three years from now, come back and, and speak with us again. Great. Thank you, Mr. Poe. I think we will see advancements in imaging and mm -hmm. pay, therefore patient selection for the adequacy and margin, mm -hmm. R0 resection. I think we will see advances in immunotherapy uh, that will help us facilitate shrinkage and perhaps get an R, better R0 resections or maybe even obviate or delay surgery in some of these recurrence. The power of immunotherapy is 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 quite impressive. Uh, I think similarly with uh, advances in radiation oncology and medical oncology, I think all of these uh, will help us uh, to the point that we may see lesser surgery. Maybe put in my, we may put the surgeon out of business. <laughs> there but, we go. Uh, and and actually, if we have earlier detection of cancers and um, early detection of recurrence from the first operation, which we're quite interested in here and re doing a lot of research on that, we may get to these operations, we may get to these recurrences earlier. Great, great. Well, we will look forward to that and, and hope to have you back and hope to hear about some of those things. Uh, let me wrap up with just a few things. We want to say a big shout out to uh, people all over North Carolina uh, who generously support the UNC Lineberger Comprehensive Cancer Center and the University Cancer Research Fund, and in turn, the UNC Lineberger Cancer Network. So thank you. We want to thank our team, Venny Obore, John Powell, Oliver Marth, Andrew Dodgson, Nadja Brown, and Pat Muscarella. Uh, they all work very hard to bring these to you to facilitate those multidisciplinary tumor boards and a whole host of other activities. So thank you to this incredible team. We want to let you know that we always have more lectures coming up. Uh, very excited about our next one, the SICEP lecture that's closing the chasm between native community priorities and cancer prevention and healthcare research priorities uh, with Slobon Westcott, MD, MPH. Then we've got a, in, in, uh, that's, that kicks off February, the next week, therapeutic management of lymphedema, then oral chemotherapy, providing monitoring and safety, and then incorporating the caregiver as a member of the multidisciplinary team. Boy, that, that sounds like a nice uh, segue from, from uh, what you're talking about as well, uh, Dr. Guillen. So uh, lots, lots of good stuff always coming up. We have uh, enduring materials. We call them SPOC, self-paced online courses. Uh, I was just sharing with a group actually at the uh, surgical oncology uh, group in, in the cancer hospital this morning about uh, these lectures and, and uh, many others. We usually have between 30 and 36, depending on the type of credit you're wanting to get. Uh, you can take those anytime, night or day, all free. Uh, so here are some of the ones that were most recently released. And you can go to learn.uncLCn.org to, to find out more. 
All right. Uh, UNCLCN at unc.edu or 919-445-1000. If you have any trouble claiming credit, have any questions about how everything works, let us know. UNCLCN.org is our main site. We're on Facebook, uh, ViewMedi, Twitter, uh, YouTube, lots of places you can find us. Dr. Guillem, this has been amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to our audience for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you all soon. Take care. Have a great afternoon. You too. Thanks, everybody. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. All right. Good to see everyone. Bye-bye.